Okay, so this obvious video about Medusa is going to introduce us to another minor planet. And I did see that Medusa was conjunct, at least two women in our group had Medusa conjunct Mars. So that's a very interesting story. The one that I'm about to tell you dates back to Medusa from ancient India, from ancient Egypt, and um, in all of North Africa, Libya, had this snake-haired goddess representing one of the triple goddesses. So what we are all finding right now is there are earlier stories. So Emmeline did an incredible video about Ashera, Ashera, which was the original name of Hera, the queen of heaven. And when the Greeks got hold of the myth, they made Hera a jealous wife. So you see how when the patriarchal influence came onto the planet, that's basically the story of Lilith fled the life tree. And that gets into also the asteroid Lilith, which is different from Black Moon Lilith, in that the asteroid Lilith is when Gilgamesh cut down the life tree and the Divine Feminine fled. Now after that period, what happened is a certain influence of the patriarchy in which the masculine wanted to change all the stories. So Asherah, who was the queen of heaven and the beloved of God, so it was naturally God and goddess, um, that myth turned into Hera being a jealous wife. Hera was also known as Juno or Yoni and the sacred marriage bed. And the triple goddess was basically that one who was the sacred marriage bed, Hera or Juno. Then the triple goddess was Athena, the powerful warrior maiden. And then the third was Medusa, the snake-haired goddess who allowed for a deep look into the void and the action of the kundalini. So each of the snakes represents your kundalini rising but you see that open mouth, that dark cave. It's also looking deeply into the void of what's between the worlds, what happens when you die. And Medusa was the snake-haired goddess and she was kind of what we consider the, the, uh, the triplet and the triplicity, the dark goddess who rules everything in the afterworld and the void realms. So let's talk about how she relates to the blood mysteries. So originally Medusa um, ruled over all of the blood mysteries and her look, like a pre-menstrual look, would cause men to turn to stone. And every woman and probably men can relate to that. So when you're just about to bring your blood, you become deeply psychic. You start to look into all the fearful and dark things you look right down, down into the void and say, gosh, I'm, I'm totally not even part of this reality. I'm starting to see that nothing even matters. I'm going to just show this same dark voidal reality to everyone who looks at me. And they're going to be scared because they're looking into that part of the void that they don't want to look into. And that is Medusa. In her blood mystery, a pre-menstrual woman was said that she could turn a man to stone. So that's where that story came from, is the serpent-haired one can turn a man to stone. Now this week I've also heard um, stories of people, well particularly women, who in postpartum, postpartum is another blood mystery. So postpartum woman she starts to see between the worlds. She sees that this veil is illusion. I know when I was postpartum, I had so many other lifetimes showing up, I started to feel schizophrenic. And that's another one of the blood mysteries when man is like, man is like I don't know if I can do this with you. <laughs> you're, you're getting supernatural and you're very emotional and all of the wounding is coming up. So that's another time so postpartum is another part of the blood mystery. The other client that I had this week had been through menopause. So the menopause blood mystery, when the blood finally no longer comes and your soul absorbs every bit of what the ovaries used to do 
and the eggs used to be present and suddenly the female soul becomes a very wise that's the crone the wisdom part of the blood mystery so that's when you really become a strong um, feminine wisdom of having absorbed all of your own eggs and now don't need to reproduce anymore. You have all the wisdom inside you. The next part of the blood mystery is when you pass through puberty and the teenage girl and she starts to get her blood and she's starting to be very beautiful and incredibly attractive and bloom like an incredible flower or a rose. And that part of it is where the patriarchy intercepted this myth. So when uh, we lost some of the energy of the divine feminine and she retreated from this planet, like Lilith retreated when the life tree was cut down, what happened was the Perseus story was about the teenage girl, okay? When she started to bloom and because she was so beautiful, she was attracting the attention of many men and in the story that I know about Medusa what happened was this beautiful woman was attracting the attention from some a figure called Poseidon which is just a name and my version of the story is that her head was severed okay and I don't know who severed her head because there's several versions of the story but what happened was Athena her sister took the severed head, tied it or sewed it onto her own breastplate, and she continued to ride into battle because at the time the Libyan Amazonian women were battling with a patriarchal race from that same area that I think were the ancient Romans were the ancient Martians. Okay, it was a patriarchal male society that wanted to destroy all of the divine feminine. So the way that I see this myth in my inner eye is that Medusa's head was then sewn onto the breastplate of Athena and Athena, a horseback riding woman, very strong matriarchal tribal women, continued to fight in battle with this screaming head tied or sewn onto her breastplate. And so for me, at a period of my life when I really needed to be Medusa-like, enough is enough. We're going to have a look at this. We're going to have a deep look at this stuff. The dark stuff between man and woman is what I'm talking about. I painted this onto a skin, and I sewed that up, and my fingers were bleeding, and it was really intense. I did it super fast, like pulling the needle through the... The skin because I needed to assert that authority of the triple goddess in her dark phase of looking into the void. So it feels really prominent right now. I know many people are crying, their kids are crying. Um, there's a lot of heavy energy with all of these planets that are retrograde. So Medusa is starting to really come up in the psyche. And I want to read to you some of the different words associated with her. And you can find her in your chart as Minor Planet 149. So she has uh, a longer orbit, just like we found about Magdalene. She's actually a minor planet. It's only a 3.2 year orbit. And some people were asking, you know, how long does it stay in each of the signs? These might have big elliptical orbits, so from Mars and Jupiter, then around the sun. And they might stay in some of the signs longer, so many months, and then shoot through some of the signs very fast. And I cannot find that kind of information on these minor planets, and maybe you can. The next piece is it's significant in your chart, really within a two-degree orb or within, within a three-degree orb, if Medusa seems to be a prominent energy for you so that you have that kind of female wisdom, that looking into the void, the dark moon goddess energy in your chart, 
So for when I looked up Medusa, she was in three degrees of my south node. And to me, I would take that um, from the past. I've definitely looked into all of those energies of the ancient goddess. So I would say in the past, that's how I even know who Medusa is. She's really part of my past. Probably I was a matriarchal horseback riding woman. There's no doubt about that. And it's very likely that I had the serpent haired goddess on my chest or on an amulet or in some kind of an art form. So you can use that minor planet 149 if it's within a three degree orb of something significant. If you feel like the dark goddess is really powerful in your chart. So Medusa was the serpent goddess of the Libyan Amazons representing female wisdom. In Sanskrit, her word is Meda. In Greek, it's Metis. In Egyptian, it's Met or Ma'at. She was the past, present, and future, mother of all gods before birth existed. All that has been, that is, and that shall be. Because she is representative of the void, she said, quote, no mortal has yet been able to lift the veil that covers me. And what that means to me in translation actually is it's that ability to know that you're immortal and the ability to know that you're immortal is to go into the void, the zero point before creation existed. And I feel very much like that's where we're going right now. I'm every day I'm going, who am I? I don't know who I am. I'm just hoping that I can show up to any of my appointments. It's starting to be like, can I keep going on? Oh my gosh. And in fact, next month, I'm not even sure what we're going to do because I'm starting to feel like I need to go deep inside, like just meditate and retreat. I'm starting to feel like this whole next month from our very powerful August 11th new moon eclipse is going to be even deeper into the Medusa realms, into the void, into that immortality, looking way deep into the veil. So another meaning of her, her hidden face or hideous face, as the Greeks called it, is the menstrual magic. So ancient people believed that a look from a menstruous woman could turn a man to stone. So just in those two sentences, Okay, the menstrual magic, the hidden face, a look from a menstruous woman can turn a man to stone. And this is where the Greeks then developed their myth. And the word monster came from menstruous. So there was a really deep magic about a woman who was coming into her blood, either through uh, puberty or her monthly cycle or right after um, giving birth and she's still bleeding really heavy and she's given birth to another being and then she's postpartum. That's also a blood mystery when she's like an oracle of Delphi who can see between the worlds. And then when she's going through um, into her crone phase, the final blood in which she absorbs all of that energy of Shakti within to her soul and is truly a powerful woman. And many, many men fear those stages. Like they'll run away when a woman is PMS. They'll run away when a woman is postpartum. They'll run away when the woman goes through menopause. And that's where the word menstruous came from. Um, so for man, if this is show, showing up in the chart, the look that turns a man to stone the man should determine if he's afraid of women in their blood and in the blood magic, or is he fine with that? Does he support that? Is he, is he able to hold space for a woman who's crying all night because she's deeply in the wound of so much grief? And women will feel that, particularly around the moon cycle. So Medusa represented the life-giving blood of woman, the female wisdom of the crone, the prophecy that happens every month when you have your blood, the healing, which women are all able to heal, particularly when they're in their, their cycle, 
magic and all the blood mysteries. That's what Medusa represents. The Greeks portrayed Medusa as a woman who was punished for her sexual appeal. And we've heard this throughout all of the myths. So the same thing with the Chiroptic story is that the sea nymph was too beautiful. Don't be so beautiful because you might be raped. That basic story is in every single story. So it's reversed with Hera. Hera and Hephaestus, she is um, pregnant with a child and because her partner is polyamorous, she is trying to have this child that then she just throws away because he's not golden enough. So this is all like a fear-based stuff around woman. That's why I want us all to just basically erase the whole myth of Perseus. Erase all the baloney in which uh, it was a fear-based, you're too beautiful, I'm going to rape you, which is basically the Perseus story. That story was invented to account for a patriarchal view of the triple goddess of which Medusa, or Metis, was a widely recognized symbol of the divine feminine wisdom. A female face surrounded by serpent hair representing the, the sexual energy or the kundalini of the wise blood that women have that gives us our divine power to procreate another life, to see into the future, to be an incredible oracle. This is all part of the Medusa story. So um, just to say, woman is also deeply afraid to be in her blood magic because she is also afraid that if she really goes into those emotional realms that man will leave. So woman gets terrified right after she gives birth because she's absolutely helpless. Will he just leave because I'm going schizophrenic and seeing into all these different worlds? Or when she finds out her blood didn't come and she finds out she's pregnant, that's the next piece of terror of, oh my gosh, my blood didn't come. He might leave. What am I going to do? This is like a core... Um, uh, contributor to the psyche of, of humans. So start to look into what this means for you. And I guess what I should do is just listen for a second. Uh, what do we need to know about this, Lindsay? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if there's anything, I mean, that I can add to this. I, I relate strongly to this story. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I have nothing to add. <laughs> okay, so that's really good. Um, I feel like I covered it really well, and you can all look up Minor Planet 149. Watch the transits of that planet also, so that if it's showing up during an eclipse, uh, look at it in the eclipse chart, look at it where is it transiting one of your personal planets right now. The other thing is I noticed that the prenatal eclipse, whatever asteroid is at your prenatal eclipse, also look into that asteroid because one of our members has Lilith, the asteroid Lilith, at her prenatal eclipse, and then she has Gilgamesh at some other point in her chart. So again, when key figures and stories show up, you want to really look at what are the points and planets that that myth is taking in your chart. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is transits, and I put up a quick introduction video for you because it's very hard for me to show you charts. Like, I can hold up a chart right now, but it's going to be hard. The most important thing that separates a professional astrologer from a hobbyist or from the thousands or hundreds of thousands of sites where you can print your chart for free and print a short report for free is that you can accurately read the transits. And I did like a 10 minute video and I counted at like two minutes. I had this woman totally okay that she wasn't going to divorce her husband. By four minutes, I had explained to her the womb blessing that she could receive and within, I'm sure, six minutes, I realized that her father's son was conjunct her natal Mars. 
and that Jupiter was going over it right now, so some blessing was happening in that conversation. Because often people will have had their chart read five or six or maybe even 30 times before. When they are getting a chart reading with you, they want to find an astrologer who can quickly tell them, am I out of alignment or what is happening to me right now? Because my husband is not approaching me sexually. He feels absolutely cold. Um, that's when you can read the chart really quick of the transits and go, oh, now don't worry, Pluto is sitting on your Venus right now. You're going to have a major rebirth around your love life, and that's just perfect. And in the chart, what you can see is it's not just the conjunction, say that Pluto is conjunct, the Venus, but then whatever... Um, aspects that that makes. So then Pluto's squaring here, Pluto's squaring there, Pluto's making an opposition there. So Pluto is not just conjunct Venus, it's squaring Mars, it's doing that, you know, it's doing all of those things. And in order to be a great astrologer, this language of the transits is the most important thing. So um, there is a short report forecast at astro.com, and I, I looked at it for mine. I can't, I can't look at it at all, but I just looked at it for mine and was like, oh my gosh, this is so bad, because the words are things like threatened. You will be threatened by events. And I'm like, I will be threatened by events. Well, that's possible, but there's also a really better way to say that. So Uranus conjunct Saturn, and this is all written by Robert Hand, who in 2013 took back his whole system and said, I, I, I only will do whole signs. They also have the, the forecast in the Placidus system, so they're not looking at the right house either. So it's totally wrong. It's absolutely wrong. So when you do something on any of these um, forecasts, and even the, the predictions of astrologers, oh my gosh, I can't listen to any predictions of astrologers. They are so wrong with what we need to actually be saying. Uranus is the flashes of insight. So they are calling it threatened by sudden events. I'm calling it flashes of insight. Just think about those two different. So if I were to say to my client, you're going to be threatened by sudden events versus you will have flashes of insight. That's really important right there. And then you find out what house it's in. So the next thing is you will have flashes of insight into the eighth house of dimensions. And then another key word of Uranus is revolutionary ideas. Okay, get your keywords down. And then it's conjunct Saturn. So then my next phrase is regarding the father <laughs> or the patriarchy, which is what I just did was I explained to you the difference between what, how the patriarchal view of don't be beautiful or you'll be raped and we'll cut off your head and you'll be a goddess who, who's decapitated screaming forever. Like that's the patriarchal view of Medusa's myth. Totally different. So I'm having revolutionary ideas regarding the father, the traditional structures, and the divine masculine. Okay, that's all of my words for Saturn. Then, another word for Uranus, unusual and rebellious. <laughs> On the current structures of how the magical realms in the eighth house are being influenced. Do you see how all I'm doing is putting in the same key words that we use all the time? It's just the upgraded language the breakaway from those structures. Okay, so again, Uranus can break away. It's revolutionary, it's rebellious, it has flashes of insight. The breakaway from those structures, the word structure is Saturn, that no longer serve your mission for the stability of the ascension of Gaia, okay, because it's in Taurus. So then I add by sign, the earth sign Gaia, the stability of Taurus. So that's the way I write um, a transit. Totally different. If you put in my birth information and look up my short report forecast, you're going to be, oh, girl, 
Lalita, you're going to go through hell. You'll be in debt. You're going to lose your partner. Someone's going to die in your family. Basically, that's what it says. Because they think that the eighth house is about debt, death, and letting go of, of your sexual relationship. Because they, they put the uh, sexuality in the eighth house. Because remember, we, that one guy ejaculated and he said that was death. And all modern astrologers put sexuality in the eighth house. It had nothing to do with it. Okay? So let's use a different example. So you're going to need to do your chart. And you can put Medusa in and see where Medusa's transiting because I really, I'm going to find out where Medusa's transiting right now. She's zero degrees Libra. Zero degrees Libra. So she just entered my first house and boy, am I feeling it. Oh my gosh. I feel like I just need to go into the darkness of the void now. So she has just entered my first house and oh my gosh, am I feeling like I need to go into the dark. Like I'm just going to. Not talk to anyone for a while. That's how I feel. I've got so many clients. Listen, after this last eclipse, which would, would, an eclipse is also a transit, okay, I had so many hysterical people. I needed a secretary. I needed two secretaries. I had one after the next nonstop. And you know what? They put money in my PayPal before I even know who these people are. And then they have hysterical things of what just happened to them. And then you know what? And then I never see these people again. And their money's in my PayPal, and I don't even know who they are. I have somebody with the last name Scott. I, she never, she put, she gave, I'm like, oh, well, I don't know who you are or how to give this money back to you. Like, do you want your chart read? That's what happened on the last eclipse because it was a grand square with Mars conjunct the moon. Holy crap, did I get rich. I deposited over $1,000 in one day. Do you hear me? And it's because people were hysterical and I was trying to be like, well, you know, let's wait until next week and we can look at this next week. And, and one, per one person was so hysterical. She's like, okay, well then I'm just sending you a check in the mail. I'm like, I can't even like not take your money. You're sending me a check in the mail. Like what is with you people? I can't really help you just breathe. Okay. Um, and I just kept responding all day long. Let's just meditate. Let's meditate for the eclipse. Please, let's just meditate today. And so that was my response again and, and again and again is when Mars is conjunct the moon, do not take their money. If they put it in your PayPal account, then what are you going to do? Because you didn't agree to do anything. But I responded, please just meditate. Please meditate today. Um, and many of you saw my new video on the next eclipse. This is not for everyone to get hysterical because eclipses are very powerful transits. It's for everyone to meditate and get into unity consciousness because we want to open a doorway for the best consciousness of humankind. And I really feel like the last eclipse was totally preparing us for how chaotic this one could be. I need everyone to meditate, really meditate at the moment of the eclipse. I don't care what you think you're doing. Set your alarm and meditate. Now, let's keep going on transits. So an eclipse is a transit. When you do your transits, which I want all of you to do every single transit, the other thing is in the short report forecast, which you can look at, their dates are wrong because they just give some random dates of something that might possibly be, be within a three degree orb. So you have to now get an ephemeris to do the transits and really find out when will Jupiter actually be conjunct Neptune, the actual dates of that being within a three degree orb. And once it passes my Neptune, then it's separating. So once it passes your planet, they still have it on there, but it's separating. It's going to be like that. Start to watch it. As soon as Mars gets off your moon, boom, the next day you're fine. So just watch it and know when the end date is. Look in the ephemeris. So then you put down the dates, Jupiter conjunct Neptune, October 31st to November 9th, 2018, in the second house, because you got to know what area you're working with. Oh, this is why tons of people are giving me money. Oh, Jupiter conjunct Neptune in my second house. I can't even turn them away. They're sending me checks in the mail whether I like it or not. I want my chart read. 
Holy crap, all of you people get ready so you can start reading charts, please. So in the second house, the I call it the values of spiritual and mystical Neptune with the expansion and blessings of Jupiter. Okay, so those are my key terms, spiritual and mystical Neptune, expansion and blessings of Jupiter, in the occult knowledge, because it's in Scorpio for me, will give you a greater sense of compassion for the depths, because that's Scorpio, of the mystery. The grace of self-worth, so I'm not saying, and tons of money, the grace of self-worth, because the second house is values and self-worth, how you feel about yourself and the resources that you have, through service to others and the receiving of resources by keeping with the highest ideals. I'm sure you can imagine what it says on um, astro.com. It does not say <laughs> through the service to others and the receiving of resources by keeping the highest ideals. It does not say that. But you've got to upgrade every single transit now. It was enough that we have to upgrade all the asteroids. You have to upgrade the language for all the transits. Let me read you just one more so you have an example. Then Jupiter conjunct Venus because my Neptune is at 2959 or 58. So the very, basically, the, within a, a very short period of a week, Jupiter is then going to be conjunct my Venus in Sagittarius because it will change signs. So by December 6th, in the third house, blessings, well, and because Venus is love, in the love life, and the higher ideals of Sagittarius, Sagittarius, enjoyment and expansion of communication, because the third house is about communication, the ability to relate to loved ones with ease. Okay, so those are just some of my examples, and I don't want to keep going. i got a whole bunch of things that are happening right now. But the transits for you are going to be the transits of basically 12 planets. So you're going to do... What is Uranus doing? What is Ceres doing? What is Jupiter doing? What is Mars doing? Even the, the moon moves every two to two and a half days, but when the moon suddenly returns to its natal position, you'll feel that really strongly. So I want you to become like transit nerds, all right? Basically what you want to do is draw your chart out really big like that, and then you can put the asteroids in, the prenatal eclipse, whatever you want. And then uh, in pencil, if you want to, put your transits on the outside and watch them move so that when you feel, um, like say that the moon moves over your natal Pluto, feel that day. Feel it really strongly. What does that day feel like? And I'll take this back from Lindsay because... Um, when you find a chart that has that natally of moon conjunct Pluto, you'll remember the transit of that day and remember like, oh my gosh, did that ever go deep that day with my emotions, with the feelings in my body? I went really deep that day. Mm -hmm. So understanding the transits also helps you understand when you're giving a chart reading, both what's going on in the natal chart and how they're affected by that transit. So because I've had Pluto go over every one of my personal planets, in the introduction one that I read, when I saw that Pluto was going to go over her Venus, she was like, am I going to get a divorce? Do not answer that. I did get a divorce then. Okay, but that, that doesn't mean that she's going to get a divorce. You say, well, this is a perfect time to dive into the feelings of love that you have for yourself. Do you need to do any work around sexual de-armoring? Do you need to do any work around healing? And her response was that she is a psychotherapist. Uh, she works as a psychiatric nurse, and she takes clients all the time, and she feels like she's done it all, but what else could she do? So you hear in the video that I, of course, turned her uh, onto the womb blessings from Sandra Rolis, and then she started to recall the depth of what happened in her family 
where, um, and this is private, so we're not going to share this, but that she came from a Catholic family. And if you read Barbara Hanclaw's um, stuff on basically, oh boy, this is going to be really, Emmeline, I hope you can deal with this, lovey. Through the uh, religious organizations is how entities are passed. And some of the darkest entities happen through the communion and the things that are passed through the hand of a priest who's a pedophile. And basically that's what went on in her family. Her father was a rapist. He raped all of the children from the time they were toddlers. And then her, her brother also became a priest. And after 15 years, he was released as, as basically the same. So when I heard that, I said, well, it seems like even if you feel like you um, uh, have done a lot of healing, it sounds like you can do more. Maybe you can do some of the sexual de-armoring and um, ancestral healing for the collective now and put it into, you know, whatever you do and meditate, you can do that for everyone on the planet. But wow, like it was big. And um, you will often see this in the clients that you have. So be ready that the most religious clients that have like parents who were ministers or priests are usually um, have received that kind of wounding. It's very heavy. And when they reach out to you, you're not going to say anything about their religion. You're going to really point them mythologically to different stories of Chiron. Okay, so that's what I worked on with her in the chiractic wound. So I'll let Lindsay ask any questions on this one. Uh, well, just to clarify uh, on the transits, if, if um, an asteroid is prevalent in your natal chart, then you would also look at the asteroids in the transits. Definitely. And only then, because you're not going to look at every asteroid in the transits as well, mm -hmm. right? Is it the same rule for the natal and for yeah, uh, the so transits? Yeah, so the transits um, of the major asteroids that are prominent in your chart or if they suddenly pop into your consciousness, like Medusa has really come into my consciousness. And then of course, Lindsay found that it has just entered Libra. So it just entered my first house. Probably as I was writing the description of Medusa, she was entering my first house. So if a transit is prominent in your chart, always look at that. If the asteroid is prominent in your chart, always look at that for its transit. But also, like if Phaeton or Magdalene or Yeheshua suddenly pop into your awareness or Isis, look them up too and um, rewrite the story, rewrite the transit of what that means. So I feel like I'm coming into my woman's wisdom and the blood mystery is really strong right now and totally rewriting all the patriarchal view of what these stories are. And then I think in our next video, we'll do a very short video on um, what a solar return is, which basically is an imprint of the transits of the day. So should we do that, Lindsay? Sure.